<laughs> Hope you're having a fabulous Wednesday and had a fabulous, even more fabulous week. Sipping on some Pinot Noir tonight, and I need you to tell me really quickly, test, test, is the audio A-OK? -okay? And I'm going to, I'm going to take, Perfect. sorry, what? Perfect here. Okay. Awesome, and I am going to just check, make sure we're live everywhere. Tonight, guys, um, is hopefully you can hear us all so far. I got the poofy hair tonight, sorry. Um, Felicia, unfortunately, had to cancel. We are planning to cover Vibrio and bacterial infections very soon on Wine Wednesday, but we didn't want to cover it when she had to cancel uh, for personal reasons. So we will be covering that topic soon. But tonight... We thought, after looking through the posts online lately, that we would cover all of the false information still floating around the internet about seahorses. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Of course, if you have a topic or a problem or anything that you need to discuss, you can jump in or comment in the comment section. And of course, we will, you know, um, go to that immediately. But that's the topic we're focusing on. And I'm, I'm thinking that we are, yep. Looks like we're live everywhere. A-okay, all right. Test, test, good so far. I see the thumbs up. Thanks, guys. Okay, so first off, to start us off for the night, how is everyone? Looks like everybody got into Zoom okay. Awesome. We're gonna, we're gonna try something towards the end of the stream, uh, switching around the layout and see if people like that better, where you don't have to look at my mug all the time on the side. But, anyone, how are we doing this? We calling anything new with you? Nothing new, doing fine. Um, all the seahorses are doing well. The babies, I have two batches. I have one batch that's gonna be nine weeks Friday and the other is gonna be four weeks Friday. That is awesome. Good. Bravo to you, seriously. Ray? I haven't had to evacuate them, so that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, uh, after the stream last week, Cheryl messaged me and told me how absolutely concerned she was because you're in California. Has anything else occurred that you did not have to evacuate? So is everything? Everything's good. I'm still packed just in case. And then I have a plan even for the seahorses. I'll be able to, you know, bring them if I need to. So I have a kit for them. So I'm all prepared, but I stay that way about fire season lasts a few months. So through October. So I just stay packed all that time just in case. But so far, so good. Awesome. Well, I'm glad. And we're all thinking of you every day that we're not with you. And every time you come to Wine Wednesday, we feel better, just to let you know. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Ray, anything new with you? No, nothing new here. Other than the smoke. Smoke? <laughs> That's <Yeah>. all my fault. <laughs> I see. Okay. Did you get any of the uh, weather, Dan? No. Um, we just get the like rain. And, rain. We, yeah, we got some rain a couple days ago that was, you know, quite a bit. But uh, we had some rain this afternoon, but it's typical Florida rain. Yeah. Okay, guys, really quickly, because Dan's getting fancy schmancy with the green screen. I'm going to come to the rest of you, I promise, in one second. But I wanted to test this part, too, with Zoom. If I change my view, does it change on the video is the question. And it does. So we get to see floating head Dan in the middle of the tank. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> okay, sorry. I'll go back. I just wanted to see if I, if I switched. And for anyone who is watching, uh, who joins the Zoom room, um, Nicole, Cheryl, all of you guys, if you're not seeing the speaker that's talking, you need to go up to the right hand corner and switch between gallery view and speaker view. When I switch it, it'll show on the video, but you know, for you guys to see it in person live, um, you'd have to switch it yourself. So just wanted to say that real quick. All right, back to the point. Dan has disappeared, but are you doing okay this week, Dan? <laughs> He's been playing with this, you guys. He's been playing. That was funny, Dan. I should have had a big screen still. You got to tell me when you're going to do that stuff, Dan. Here, I'll put speaker view for now. And we'll see how it goes. All right, Mich uh, Dan, how's it going? Going good. Going good. Anything new? Uh, not really. Same old stuff. Gotcha. Well, well, hey, you guys are making it simple on me today. All right, Miss Cheryl, anything new with you? Anything well, new with one of the pairs that Dan sent me of the combs, 
they are definitely not keeping their tails off of each other so I am hopeful and his pouch is uh, he's definitely inflating his pouch so we might have so, some little comb baby soon yeah I may have some combs sometime in the next I don't, I don't know month or two well hey I, I want to be first on that list if you do <laughs> just to let you know <laughs> I, I got to raise him first. <laughs> I know, I know. And and I certainly wouldn't want it before that because you do a fantastic job and that's not easy work. So thank you for all that you do. Uh, Miss Nicole, anything new with you? If you don't want to unmute, just... Oh, there's my beautiful Nicole. You look so pretty. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks. Um, no, not a whole lot new. All my adults are still alive, which thank God. I'm still waiting for Diamox. Angela, thank God, is sending some, but um, it's taken a while to get to me. Right. And three bigger babies are still alive. The four that the um, that, that were given birth to last Wednesday night, I think I'm pretty sure that they were premature because they were floppy and gotcha. didn't look well right from the beginning. And then a few days later, of course, he had a whopping 10 babies. <laughs> Uh, I even checked the filtration, so I think that's really all he had. And I've only lost one so far. So they're five days old today. So Awesome. Great job. And with the um, with the Dymox, in case you guys missed anyone who's joining us first time this week, we discussed last week that uh, she was having a, a, a GBD issue and um, is is looking is going to treat with Dymox. Um, how are the seahorse? Is it just one? It, now it's just one, yeah. Okay, good. Um, three out of the four looked like they might be coming down with something last week, but now it's just the one. And he's, I unfortunately, I'm like literally force feeding him. I'm putting like mm. the tail <clears throat> of the mice, the frozen mice, in his mouth to make him snick at it. And that's the only way I can get him to eat right now because oh. his eyes are still so enlarged despite the fear into it. Like I said, I'm still waiting for the Diamox. It, right. I ordered it probably Thursday last week after, after we talked from Angela, but it's just, she's in Michigan. I'm in Massachusetts. So it's not close. Sure. So it's, it's taken a little bit of time. So I'm hoping that at least force feeding him will keep him. Yes. Cause that, that seems to be the biggest problem right now. He doesn't seem like he's still active despite the huge, like he can't see the food. He mm. can't see it. Mm. So I'm force feeding him. I'm not too feeding, but force feeding, but he's, I was going to so say, fingers crossed. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, I was going to say, Ray's, Ray's got got some experience with that. I, I've never had to, to get that detailed, but it's amazing what you're doing to try to save the seahorse. And we all have fingers crossed, and I, I just, I feel like you're going to you're gonna be okay. <laughs> I just feel like it's going to work out. I hope so. I yes. hope so. And uh, so glad that we have Wine Wednesday so that you got the, the right information because I misled you a little bit, but <laughs> now, no, now you know. No, you didn't mislead me at all. I just was pulling, grasping for straws when I right. messaged you. I was frantic, so. <laughs> well, we're all here for you and i um, so glad that at least it's not worse, right? It's not worse? Not worse, no. no okay. It felt the same. In fact. Is he getting enough food? N Nicole, how often I can you feed so. them? I'm home um, right now. I'm home all day, so right. I'm doing it quite a few times a day. Okay, but you think it's getting enough food? I hope so. I'm trying. That's all I can do. I can get them to at least, and I use the um, the PE mice, so it's huge. So I'm getting at least him to snick a few pieces. Once I get that tail in there enough, he'll just snick. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, is it because he can't see it, or is it because? Yeah, I just... think it. No, I think he can't see it. Honestly. Okay. I don't, I, but who knows? I don't, I really can't, I couldn't tell you because he can't tell me what his thoughts are. But right. I, I hope it's just because he can't see it because he's still swimming around and he's doing his own little thing, even in the hospital tank. Okay. So, so once the eyes go down, if he's still having a problem, contact me and I'll tell you the next step to do. All right. Thank you. Dan's always fantastic yeah, about this stuff. Go ahead, Chuck. They need to be fed about every three hours. And what happens is basically they run out of go, go juice. And if you can feed them smaller amounts every three hours, you're going to be much better off because you're not going to have a lot of waste. Right. The other factor is keep the nursery absolutely sterile. 
And that that can be tough also. And, but when, I, when I'm raising fry, depending on their age, I'm usually cleaning the nursery every three to four hours and in between adding more food. And it makes a big difference. It's right. very labor intensive. This yeah. is one of my adult males that's I, I think I, I, sorry. Sorry. No. no, I was just gonna say, I think she's jumping around and kind of answering every everything you talked about. Uh, I heard, I got right. what you're saying, Cheryl. And Nicole, just to let you know, um, on that topic of the fry that were premature, I've had that happen too. In my case, the fry were so obviously premature, like they weren't even developed. It yeah, was very odd. Was, yeah. the, the four that were born on that particular day looked like translucent and they were just floppy and laying on the bottom. Yeah. So don't so beat I yourself up. I had a feeling that, no, I'm not at all. I honestly, I really didn't expect them to live. They could, didn't even make it through mm -hmm. probably 16 hours. I knew I kind of had a feeling. Yeah. They weren't, you know, they weren't doing much of anything. And then the, the ones that were born a few days later looked significantly different. Good. It's a, it's crazy how much a few days can make. Well, one thing is too to keep in mind, depending on the age and the size of the adults, there can be a big difference in the quality of fry they produce. Oh, yeah. And I, I've got pictures of a wild caught pair of combs that I had that produced fry that had great big eyes, really short snouts, and were minuscule. And a year later, after working with them, they were producing nice, big, normal fry. So don't blame yourself in, because it, it does make a huge difference in the age and size of the adults. It'll get better. <laughs> Absolutely. I hope so. <laughs> You're going to have amazing fry very soon. Just get this, you know, I think straightened out, and I, I bet you'll be jamming, and especially with dance by the eight week year, The eight-week-old ones, they're just, they've grown so much. They're amazing. You're doing a good job with them. That's I think you're doing great. Three out of 16 for my first batch. I didn't think that was that bad. No, <laughs> for your first batch and, and such a small, yeah. yeah. My, my, my biggest disaster was in 2007, my first real success raising large numbers of Erectus. And we had a ice storm that took out power for about 14 hours at my house. The fry tank, the nursery tank, got down in the low 40s, and all the fry were laying on the bottom. I put a heater in there, gradually rewarm, put a heating pad under the tank, spent four days rewarming it, did not lose a single one of those little guys. That's amazing. And I had tears in my eyes, trust me. Oh, <laughs> I bet. It's hard, and it's hard, especially every day that they get a little bit older, you get a little bit more attached. Yep. And it hurts a little more every time. <laughs> Absolutely. It's true. Right, Holly? You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're going through yeah. it right now. <laughs> well, now, yeah, at nine weeks, so they look like the miniature adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're about they really do. Inches, but they look just like the big ones, pretty they much. They do, and every they time you look at them, you say, wow, they're getting so big. <laughs> yeah, they're getting their personalities. You yeah. Know, yeah. know each one, yeah. You know yeah. what, you guys, I say... Um, I'm trying I'm working on like a topic listing thing so we can see what topics are coming up but I'm saying we need to have a Friday I literally just said Friday didn't I <laughs> I meant Friday um, on Wine Wednesday where you guys show us your fry and and anyone who has bread fry like Cheryl or myself or Dan or who Ray um, anyone who wants to share their like favorite batch of fry or something like that we should really do that because I had a batch of fry that were like I'm telling you they were cuter than all of yours no I'm just kidding I'm just kidding but they were they were like white and black and just magical so and I know every person's batch of fry is like uh the heart so we should we got to do that but anyway I'm, I'm just and, and it's so funny that you say Friday because literally the two times that he's had fry we're on Friday, so I'm like, oh, it's Friday! <laughs> All my batches were born on a Friday. Right? All it's Friday. At the it's same Friday. time, always at breakfast. <laughs> always at breakfast. No, no this it's, one it's, was like random Friday at morning. like 4 o'clock at night. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? Come on. You guys Actually, stop giving no, me a warning. Actually, you have to work at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> they will deliver 
at 7.15 in the morning and you've got a 30 minute drive to work and you've got to get all of them out of there and still get to work on time. Been she, there, done that. See, I call, I I call, call in to work. my daughter up the first time and I was like, you have to come down and see us and pull fry out of the tank because I have to be at work at seven. It's your turn, <laughs> you gotta go. <laughs> you know what, I'm really curious. I, Marina, I see you, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to jump to you, I promise. You know how we chit chat here on one Wednesday. Um, but Dan, I'm really curious really quick um, when we're talking about fry, I know that there are, and we're going to get to the topic, guys, I promise. But I know that there, you know, some people say it's always in the morning. Some people say it's always at night. Some people say it's a certain day. Is is this like based on lighting or? It's based upon when it's most inconvenient for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, when I say that, you know, with all the different seahorses we had, we had some that delivered first thing in the morning. We had some that delivered, you know, in the evening. We had some that would deliver over three days. Um, it, it was all over the place and it varied even among the same species. Um, there was no true tried and proven way that they would deliver. It was all over the place. Gotcha. I ran into the same thing. The males typically were fairly consistent in what they did. It's like one pair of combs I had would always deliver between midnight and 3 a.m. And I would set my alarm clock at midnight. And more than once I got up just in time to turn off the filters and watch him deliver. Uh, they're all different. And you can't count on them. Gotcha. I am listening to everyone. I'm just trying to uh, put this link in the YouTube chat also. I'll try to put it on Facebook also. Oh, you did? Oh. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it. Okay, you're on it. Thank you. If anyone uh, wants to join us and chat with us in the video, um, it's going to remain the same link every week. I have posted it. I will continue to post it. But if you need it immediately, uh, feel free to ask in the comments or um, message Dan or I. Easy as that. Um, really quick, I want to jump to Marina. Um, if you feel like chatting, how are you doing, Marina? What's new with you? Good. Not too much is new. Um, the seahorses are sort of the same. I was looking after some seahorses for one of my local fish shops, but they're back at their home now. Awesome. I know. I, so not too much. I think on a um, previous Wine Wednesday, you were having some issues. Are we? Are you, Are they resolved at this point? I don't want to bring. You know. Or I probably asked that wrong. Anyways, good. If there's anything you want to share or anything that's going on, please, of course, jump in. Feel free. With Zoom, Marina, this will be something you'll really like. With Zoom, I believe, we were playing with it last night, so we'll have to play with it a bit more, but I believe you can, like, raise your hand. <laughs> And so uh, if is it working? Is it not? I'm asking you. <laughs> Let me look. Everybody try really quickly to raise your hand. Is it not an option here? It might not maybe. That? I just see chat. So if you go to participants more, let's see. Okay, it, it, yeah, it might it might not be an option because I because of the settings, <laughs> but we're gonna try to make that happen for some of the more softer spoken people so that they can get a get a word in edgewise because I know us yappers talk really loud and a lot so, <laughs> but we'll make Actually, it work. Marina, the volume uh, on this Zoom is much better than it was uh, on the uh, Facebook. Yes, and then oh, good. Oh yeah, I can totally hear you now. And Nicole also, her volume was much better. Good. That's why we're testing it. And absolutely. Um, go ahead. Nicole's got her hand raised over here on the side. She does? Where are you seeing that? Sorry, guys. Anybody in watching, the, sorry, the, we're um, testing. Under the participants uh, window? Yeah, I just did it to test it. <laughs> nice. I'm lowering your hand, lady. And I better close that because it shows up on the video. <laughs> How do I Nicole close that? Nicole peeked out. Close. Or hey, I could even pop it out. And then is it still in the video? Let's test. It's not awesome sauce. Now I can see your hand raises. <laughs> Anyhow, um, Nicole, how'd you do it? Oh, I think I found it. You did. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm 
to and food. Um, bottom right, uh, at least I'm on my phone. The bottom right of the app says more. And then it gives the option. Awesome. So from now on, guys, if I'm yammering and going on and on or anyone else is and you've got something to say or something to ask or anything, raise your hand and one of us will see it. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing with Zoom and, and I'm so glad that we can hear everybody a little bit better. Thank you for the heart, Marina. <laughs> I'm going to have to get used to this stuff. Like that. Oh, it might be a reaction. Just, oh, I yeah, see. I think your reaction as well. Computer. Yeah, there's... Okay. There's all sorts of things to play with on Zoom, and uh, Dan and I played last night. And we we I we upgraded to uh, like a pro account so that we could have more people if needed and unlimited time. So definitely, we'll keep playing with it, guys, for sure. But uh, Marina, we're just glad you're back with us. One other question I wanted to ask you before we jump to the actual topic, half an hour in. Sorry, guys. We love each other. We love. I, I care about all of you, and I care about how you're doing. So. Anyways, I have a question for Dan. Okay, Wait, Cheryl, hang, <laughs> hang on, real quick, Cheryl, because I want to. Okay, go ahead. Increasing temperatures increases the potential for vibrio. However, Alicia is recommending keeping combs at a higher temp, uh, considering that the, she considers that they grow faster and do better. I can truthfully say I've never seen a vibrio lesion on a combs. However, it doesn't mean they cannot be susceptible or carriers to them. And I'm curious on your take on that. Well, first of all, we don't know, when we talk about bacteria, we don't know if it's Vibrio or something else. So mm -hmm. um, I have seen combs with bacterial infections. Um, ORA kept the combs at a much warmer temperature. Their uh, greenhouses would get well up in the upper 90s during the summer months. And I was surprised they were able to keep them going with the temperatures. Uh, I don't know what the tank temperatures were. They weren't quite as warm, but they were still well beyond what we would recommend. Um, it is true that if you keep seahorses at a warmer temperature, they'll grow faster. It speeds, it speeds them up. But the caveat to that is, is there's an increased risk of bacterial infections because some of the bacterial species will grow faster and be more prevalent at warmer temperatures. Uh, myself, I kept the combs at a cool temperature. I had no problems doing it. Um, you know, I, I can't sit here and say that what she's saying is not true. Um, I suspect they would be more active at warmer temperatures. But and if you remember uh, Eliza uh, down in uh, Mazatlan in Mexico, he used to do the um, engines and the redite at much warmer temperatures to make them grow faster. But he was also using large concrete ponds where we're using small tanks. I'm just not finding, you know, I started keeping combs in 2008. And I always adhere to the keep them below 74 degrees. And overall, they have tended to grow extremely well. And I have not had bacterial problems with them. So I'm just questioning the validity of that well i think there's some validity to it i just don't know if it's what i would want to do mm -hmm. you sure. know she's doing it she's having success doing it but you've got to remember you know she's a skilled um professional and she does an amazingly good job mm -hmm. however you translate that over to someone who doesn't quite know everything what they're doing i'd be a little leery of it yeah and, and for error with the hobbyist. It, and it may be very well the seahorses I'm keeping here, the combs I'm keeping here, have adapted to the cooler temps and are not showing any negative effects. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I like I said, I kept them at a cooler temperatures. I had no problems doing it, yeah. and uh, I preferred doing it. They do grow slower than some of the other species, yes. but you know, I just resigned myself to they grew slower and just let them grow slower. Well, the female in my picture here was my wild, my wild caught female, and I kept them for over seven years, and they were kept below 74 all the, the entire time. So I'm just questioning how much temp has on growth rate and reproduction on them. Well, I can tell you from other studies and talking with some of the companies. Oh, Dan, you're, you're breaking up. 
Am I still breaking up? Nope. From talking to some of the scientists and reading some of the studies, it can make a difference. Oh, you just broke up. You are now again. I don't know what's going on. You sound fine, and then it starts going. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it's probably internet connection. Oh, you sound better now. Try one more time. Sorry. Um, I don't know. Testing one, two, three. You sound great now. Okay. Your mic is going out. Not anymore. I think it's the bubbles in the tank behind them. <laughs> probably. I just want to mention, guys, uh, I definitely want to hear what Dan was going to respond uh, to Cheryl. But I want to mention, too, that uh, we absolutely intended to cover Vibrio today and bacterial infections. It's such an important topic. But we, Felicia has spent like a decade researching this information. And so we wanted to kind of... Uh, of course, you can always ask anything on Wine Wednesday, so no problems here, but we'll discuss this in depth when we have the Vibrio week. So, but what were you going to uh, say, Dan? Do you remember? Well, I just, I, when it comes to the warmer temperatures for raising fry, I won't do it. And I've done multiple experiments where I've done warmer temperatures, and it goes great at first, but then I end up with a massive crash. So, yeah. um and the only way that I control temperatures is with AC, so I have to control all the tanks. I can't just arbitrarily say, unless I put a heater in a tank, um, I'm stuck with them all doing this. I mean, a, a chiller on a tank. I'm stuck doing the all the tanks the same temperature. Still a lot to learn. Yep. I don't know if you remember back when Dr. Lin and his students at FIT did this study and it was probably 2008, 2009, somewhere around there, they came out with a study that said the ideal temperature for raising H. erectus was 80, oh, 81, yeah. 82 degrees. Oh. And um, I went back and forth with them and explained that, you know, I found something entirely different. And they were trying to tell me I had a cold water species. Mm -hmm. And we went back and forth. And finally, what we figured out was they were doing a flow through system instead of recirculating mm. and that makes a right. big difference and the same thing with uh Eliza down in mexico he's got those yeah. big concrete ponds that are flow through you know he can get away with that where you can't do that in a typical small tank and mm -hmm. i'll say the smaller the tank the more important it is to have cooler temperatures I, I think you just hit part of the nail on the head with that absolutely because larger tanks are going to be more forgiving with the seahorses and you can keep them at a warmer temp without the bacterial problems depending on how many you have in a system and what kind of filtration you're running. I think that is a ma major part of it probably. Yeah. And you guys are going to have to repeat everything you just said on the Vibrio week. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, just, I'm totally kidding. Okay, really quick. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I cut you off, Dan? Did you have something else to say? Okay. Okay, Marina, um, if are you still here? I wanted to ask really quickly because I got like I jumped in on one of your posts in one of your groups, which you you can feel free to mention if you want to um, advertise it. But also, I was curious. Uh, what the overall um, feedback you got was referring to Vibrant. So I posted um, a question asked. Lost the audio. Pardon? Oh. It, 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 the audio jumped off. I'm not sure what happened. Can you, I'm sorry. Can you start over? Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Cool. Um, I posted a question in two groups, an Australian group and another one, just asking um, what people's experience with Vibrant was, um, if anyone had had much success with it for hair algae, and... Um, if anyone sort of had any ill effects using it. And um, the overall consensus was super mixed. Mm. Um, everyone who said they either had success with it or not much success, I sort of asked what they did. And um, 
overall, it seemed like people who had, for the most part, who didn't have any success, um, used it not for very long or used it inconsistently. Oh. And it seems... Um, and it seems like the people who did have success used it sort of every week for, say, 10-ish weeks. Um, so that was interesting. There wasn't anyone who said, you know, it wiped out my tank or it did anything terrible. Um, and then there was a whole, I guess, other camp of people saying, um, do this instead or... Um, just offering other solutions, which is great too. Um, a lot of people offered a lot of um, a lot of people's advice was um, adding a lot of snails. Um, for me, that's not something that's really an ideal solution, just because I quarantine everything that's not a fish, so like coral, macro, algae, inverts, all of that for three months. So to get enough. Um, snails to sort out a pretty significant um, hair algae problem in a 1,000 litre system, they're probably going to struggle to have enough food in quarantine. And even if they don't, once the issue's sorted, then I'm, I've got a lot of snails sort of left. But I um, decided to give Vibrant a go. To my understanding, it's a het heterotrophic bacteria, so it's just a bacteria that should, in part, feed off the algae. And that sort of seems pretty in line um, with most of the methods. I try to try more natural things as opposed to a mm -hmm. chemical that will, like, melt it away. So we'll give it a go. Well, my only uh, thing that I want to add right now is please videotape it and share it with us because I will say... Um, in reference to what you just described, I tried Vibrant in my reef tank, not my seahorse tank, but I tried Vibrant and I didn't use it properly. I figured out that my skimmer wasn't working. So for, that's why people ask me about Vibrant all the time. And I'm like, I can't say that it doesn't work because I wasn't using it the way it was supposed to be used. I didn't have the skimmer running right. I didn't continue it once I figured out the skimmer wasn't working. So I, ju I just have no idea. So we need your feedback, bottom line. And I know that, you know, Nicole had some issues she talked about last week, but we're still not at all. Uh, we have no, she doesn't know that it was caused by that. It just, you know, it could have been one thing after another, but that's why your experience and when you share you know, if you get, if you make a video, I'll share it <laughs> for sure. But we would love to see, you know, how, how it affects your, your tanks. I'll definitely, um, yeah, I'll definitely keep track and record or sort pictures, of how yeah. it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether it does anything or not. Um, it's also, you can't really see either. Everyone's tank is so different. Right. Um, it, there might be a number of reasons it doesn't work for some people. Maybe it is the product, maybe it isn't. And, um, yeah, so we'll just wait and see. But um, I've had this issue since November last year. Mm -hmm. So it's been ages. And nothing will get rid of it. And it's just ugly. <laughs> it's so frustrating. I, I feel your pain. I've been there. It's so ugly. Oh, I know. I have tried a number of different basically biological stimuli for tanks and I have tested a number of them and the only one that I found that truly will help cycle a tank and knock down ammonium is the Fritz Turbo Start 900. I have not seen anything else that will do the job with the same efficacy. I'm Just so I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that Cheryl because last week when we were talking about um, bacterial starter bacteria. Uh, I just said that wrong. Starter bacteria. I forgot to mention the Fritz Fritz 900. So thank you for mentioning it. But she's talking about getting rid of, rid of hair algae. Her tank's very cycled. Um, but your advice is still fantastic. So thank you. Well, and the thing is, Dan, do you still use Fritz Turbo Start 900? I don't now, but um, there are several <laughs> brands out there that are similar to what she's talking about and basically you, you've got a 
several different types. You got the sludge eating type bacteria yeah. that they sometimes call a probiotic. You've got the nitrifying bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of other specialty bacteria out there you can put in a tank. But the turbo, the turbo start is the nitrifying, correct? That is correct. Okay. I just wanted to make, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And it, I mean, it definitely, in my experience with doing ammonia cycling and adding the, the Fritz turbo start and that kind of stuff, it really does do the job, unlike so many others that I have experimented with. Absolutely. I like, I really like Dr. Tim's, but what we need to do is get their tushies in here to tell us about their products, right? I know Sean pretty well and Dr. Tim, so maybe we'll make that happen. Um, I, I really, guys, I love when we just talk and talk and talk, but I want to definitely um, get to the topic now that we're 45 minutes in. Really quickly, I saw Salty jumped in. Salty, are you doing okay? Everything good with you? Yeah, everything's going pretty good now. Okay, well, if if you, I want to talk to you later because I've missed you terribly. Anyhow, all right, guys, really quick, what I said the top topic was. Oh, somebody, go ahead. I see a raised oh, hand. Sorry. sorry, just me. Um, something sort of interesting actually tying together the sort of hair ruggy problem and the cycling thing is what's really interesting is in my reef tank, it was my first system and I made a lot of mistakes um, setting it up and um, I didn't use, or I used what I don't think is a great quality bacteria setting it up as opposed to the seahorse tank um, where I use Dr. Tim's or a product that Dr. Tim's had worked on. I don't know if you guys have um, aquarium systems um, and there, um, Dr. Tim's worked with them and made some um, tank cycling sort of a kit. Okay. And that's what was used in that tank. And um, what's sort of interesting is I introduced the hair algae to that tank from my reef. And it did sort of spread through the seahorse tank for a little bit. And then it completely went away. Huh. Just sort of on its own. Wow. Which is interesting because it's the exact same ish, like it was the exact same algae. So I sort of theorize that maybe the better quality um, bacteria and just how the tank was cycled played a part in that. But I've got no way to prove that. Well, the, uh, before we jump to the topic, I would love to hear Dan's opinion on that because that made what the way you just described it made perfect sense to me. Um, and it's very, you're right, it's extremely interesting because I would think, I mean, I know we feed our reefs, our reef tanks with water like reefroids and feed the corals and all that stuff. But a seahorse tank is so, in my opinion, much more fed. That's so interesting that the algae, algae, algae however, <laughs> went away in the seahorse tank. So Dan, do you think it's the bacteria, better bacteria? I, I don't know that that's the case. Mm. Well, I, I love the theory either way, Marina, but go ahead, Dan. <laughs> no, I'm just not positive that is actually the case. Oh, okay, I mean, so you I, just don't know. Okay. Sorry. Um, it could be, but I just, I don't know. Gotcha. Not enough information. I thought you were, anyways, I think we should uh, look into that topic even more, Marina, because that is very, very interesting. Um, so yeah, let's all let's all do our research and come back and chat about it. But okay, guys. All right. So the topic tonight, <laughs> so late, was supposed to be all the false things that we still see running around the internet. When I started with seahorses, um, there wasn't it wasn't as bad. Seahorse.org was was up. Fusejaw.com was up. And the second that I started with seahorses, like I bought a pair. I found, I, I was doing a reef tank. I found out I could do seahorses. Oh my gosh, you can keep seahorses. Like that's, I was that person. I got a pair of seahorses, totally failed, totally failed and said, this is not obviously working. What am I doing wrong? Sought out some people, found people like Dan, Cheryl, Felicia. Felicia actually was the first person I found. She's awesome. Um, if in case I haven't mentioned that, but they helped me and explained it to me. But now I see all these groups and all this good information, yet still 
you hear the same posts over and over again that say things that we now know are incorrect. So tell me in the comments or feel free to jump in and tell me what you have seen or heard recently that's just, you know, is not correct, but is being pushed online. Um, and anyone can pipe up and say anything. Dan, do you want to start us off? What's the most recent thing you've seen and you just thought, we learned that wasn't correct years ago. What's going on? Well, what I, the most recent thing I saw was about the, the height of the tank, which is an age old thing that keeps coming up. And, you know, the problem I have with it is that, you know, people say you need a tall tank and two things. The first thing is, is that some people make the mistake of getting too tall of a tank and they can't reach the bottom. They can't keep up with the maintenance and they hate it. They end up getting out. Um, the other thing is, is that they get, say, a 30 extra tall, which is a very tall, skinny tank. Then they have circulation issues, oxygenation issues. So myself, you know, from what I've seen in terms of breeding over the last 17 years is that the height really isn't that important. If the seahorses want to do it, they're going to do it. You may as well be putting you know, a pair of teenagers in the back of a VW bug at the drive-in, if they want to do something, they're probably going to get it done. Um, that is provided they have the lateral room. If you've got the horizontal space, uh, they'll, you know, when I watch seahorses in a tank, they do more lateral movement than they do vertical. Mm -hmm. And there was a thought process at one time they needed the vertical height to, to accomplish the transfer of the eggs. Well, I have to disagree. I've had you know, some red eye that were 12 and a half, 12 and three quarters, 12 and a quarter, 10 and a half and nine and three quarters. And they were still doing the transfer in a 30 gallon uh, or 29 gallon standard 29 gallon tank, which was about 16 inches in height and water volume. And they were every two weeks like clockwork. Um, the, the pot bellies I kept in a tank that between 16 and a half to 17 inches they had no problems. Um, you know, I just, I disagree that it has to be a tall tank. And I think that people push it so much and so hard that it becomes a detriment in the hobby that people get too tall of a tank. Hmm. And not enough emphasis on the lateral space. So really quickly, I'm curious for anyone else in the room, you can either raise your hand because we got that cool new feature now, or of course speak. Um, but did you know that, that the height wasn't as important as people said? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I got a that. crazy question for everybody. Okay, hang, hang on, Cheryl. Cheryl. Anybody hey, Cheryl. have female combs that likes to hang out on the surface and pop air bubbles? Okay, well, first of all, Cheryl, nobody has female combs. You're the only lucky one. <laughs> I'm serious. But I'm serious. Okay. This one female will hang out on top, and she will swim around and pop air bubbles as they hit the surface. Jeez. Right. At first, I thought she was sick, but, I mean, she's totally healthy and all over the place. She's just but a popper. Her thing. Don't ask me. Nice. Who, who else was speaking? Sorry. Oh, I was just saying I've noticed that because I have it, my tank's really long and it's 18 inches high, but they go all over the place. They don't actually swim up to the top very often. They're back and forth and all over. So they like mm -hmm. a lot of space. Yes. And see, you know, in my, in my personal experience, I was one of those people who got really high tanks where I couldn't reach the bottom. That's not fun, um, but you know, and I would no have no way to know if it helped or not. I do. I have seen the seahorses start from the very bottom and do their beautiful twirling, magical courting dance all the way to the top, trying to lock up and do the egg exchange. But it was interesting to me to find out that it wasn't actually necessary because I didn't know that until Dan had educated me. So. I remember reading that in books. I have some old books about seahorse raising all the way back to like the 60s and 70s. And they do talk wow. about having a tall tank. <laughs> you know what, Holly? I, I would like, I'm going to hit you up on the side. I would pay to see those. That That's so cool. <laughs> and, and, and 
one thing I want to make clear to anyone who watches this later or watches is watching now is that we're not with science and with seahorses and with aquaculture and all of these things, you know, we learn as we go. You know, I know so much more than I did when I started. Dan knows so much more than he did when he started. Cheryl, etc. So just because you find a book that might have that information, that's what they thought then. We're just trying to say now we know it's a little bit different, but that's nothing against any book that says that because, you know, they were still helping people with a lot of the other information. And if people got too high of a tank at that point, whatever. But, you know. Anyways. There, there was another issue that was talked about Please, before yeah. about the height of the tanks. And that was there was a theory that a taller tank had less issues with gas bubble disease. I remember that. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the difference of 6 to 12 inches in terms of hydrostatic pressure is really insignificant. You need to be almost 8 feet deep in order to um, have enough hydrostatic pressure to force air out. So um, I disregard that entirely. Uh, I'll also say that there's currently a training program that's out there for new seahorse owners that I believe is becoming dated. And I think that's part of where some of this information comes from. I actually took that training course and <laughs> like seven years ago, it's the same course. And yeah, I would have to agree with you. And really quick question. I, I did hear Cheryl, you were trying to say something, but really quick question, Dan, um, with, with the, what you were just talking about, the theory that a higher tank will prevent gas bubble disease because of the hydro pressure, I'm not a scientist. Mm -hmm. But with that whole theory and that whole thought process, it's because if you literally live in some area where you could drop a seahorse with GVD down so many depth into the depths, it could possibly alleviate the gas bubble disease. Is that, am I saying it in basic terms or am I way off? No, it's true. We, okay. um, I worked with the Smithsonian Institute, and we used to um, take a seahorse, put him in a bait bucket with a weight, and we would drop him off the dock into 12 feet of water for 24 hours, and it would work, you know, temporarily. But, right. it, you know, it's like Diamox. It, it treats the, the symptom, but not the underlying cause. Mm -hmm. And 12 feet is a lot different than 5 inches. Right. But so you may not seahorses move in the videos in the wild they typically are li moving laterally close to the substrate they're not getting up where the waves are going to smash them they're staying down low where there's still movement but they're staying out of the really extremely high flow i disagree cheryl i'm sorry i disagree completely paul uh posts videos all the time of seahorses in the wild out in tr like thrashing thrashing movement trying to prove that seahorses don't need low flow so mm. i mean i get what you're trying to point out i'm sorry but i just they, they typically stay down lower move out of their extremely high flow it's not that they won't use the flow right but they don't Basically, when they're courting, that's when they rise up. Sure. They're not going to rise up into a huge, massive wave. No, but you will find them sometimes floating in algae. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess that the real point that you were trying to make, Dan, is that, you know, uh, would you say as you're bashing, as you're bashing the uh, theory that height is so important, would you still set a minimum for a height of a seahorse tank? Well, you know, in a perfect world, you'd want about two, two and a half times a seahorse, but it's not a perfect world. And I think having a tank that is more conducive to maintenance is better long-term for the seahorses than having a tall tank. Um, I, I, I believe tall tanks are beautiful looking tanks, yeah. but I can tell you the 110 tall, man, it didn't take me three weeks before I decided I was taking that puppy down. Sure. <laughs> One of my favorite tanks online, I won't mention the name, but it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. And it's like this colander thing, but it's, it's got to be terrible to try to clean and keep up. <laughs> I can't I've imagine. got one customer out west that has a uh, column tank that when they 
built this room, they built it at the end of a counter. And it's a 12 inch by 14 inch column tank that's about six feet high. Wow. And I don't know how the heck they do the maintenance on it, but, but, yeah. You know. Sure. Um, well, cool. I guess we've taken care of that one. Um, anyone or Dan, what other things have you seen lately that, you know, most seahorse keepers know is incorrect, but you keep seeing people post it? With the general thing of the size of the tank, um, I keep seeing, especially from, unfortunately, a lot of local fish shops, that seahorses don't need um, a big tank because they don't move that much. So you yeah. can just chuck them in a nano. Mm -hmm. I believe you were saying they don't need a big tank because they're, um, they don't move around a lot? Yeah. That well, one, that's, um, that's why they I don't move a around a lot. <laughs> I mean, you, if mm -hmm. you take a world-class athlete and lock him up in a tiny bathroom for three months, check out how much he's, how active he's going to be. Um, it, they got to have the space in order to move around a lot. And granted, they're not going to swim around like, you know, a damsel or a, um, some of the other marine fish, but they do move around. They do use the space and they'll be more active if they have the space. Uh, it is a common fallacy where, where, the stores will say that and you know i people say you need 15 gallons for every pair of seahorses and i'll argue that you need 25 to 30 gallons for every pair of seahorses to have a long-term successful tank were you gonna say something nicole or i guess not no i was gonna question the height of a ta the tank because i'm just starting a 75 gallon and now i'm like I thought taller was better. So now I'm kind of curious. I mean, it's not Did bad. Go ahead. No, but I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering because I just got this tank and it seems a little on the top tall side. I don't know if any, but I, I mean, obviously you can't tell because I don't have exact measurements. And Here. I don't mind the mess on the chair. I literally just added sand to this tank tonight after making RODI water for four days. Um, well, let, let me ask you a question, Nicole. Can you reach the bottom of the tank? Oh, yeah, I can reach the bottom of the tank, no problem. That, that I think you're fine. All right. I just wanted to make sure I'm like, well, is it bad now? Like, no, it's not that a tall I've tank is bad. Know. A tall <laughs> tank right. is not bad. It's just that what people make a tall tank. You get a 36-inch tall tank. I mean, right. you're talking about a yardstick. See, you can't reach it to the bottom. I don't know if you can see my hand in here because everything is cloudy because I literally just added live sand. So, I don't remember but, the yeah, measurements. This is my arm. <laughs> you're good. I, All right. I don't remember the measurements, but I think you're at about 20 inches tall with that tank. I, I, I believe Dan. it's probably roughly about that. Honestly, I haven't measured it. My tape measure is missing because I don't know if anybody's had three teenagers in the house at one time, but they lose their rulers and then they steal all of your tape measures. They steal everything. So those are gone. Long Dan, gone. I totally agree with you. I eliminated all my Aquion 24-gallon high tanks, 65-gallon uh, 65 ga 65 tanks, 24 inches tall, because I could not reach the bottom without getting down the ladder. And I decided this was crazy. And uh, seahorses still seem to be doing fine in 21 to 22-inch high tanks. And I can reach the bottoms. But I'm glad that Nicole asked the question because we're definitely not saying if you have already purchased a very tall tank that it's bad. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just more trouble. Go ahead, Dan. I wouldn't call hers a tall, a very tall tank. Right. You know. Right. Um, I'm talking about tanks where you can't reach the bottom, or where people sacrifice the the horizontal space for the vertical space. Right, get a really tall tank that's skinny that they yeah. don't have swim. Yeah, no, I gotcha. Mm -hmm. Totally on board with that. I love a 75 gallon tank for a seahorse tank. I think it's a great tank. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. I'm very happy with it. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see them in there. We the want to, but it is what it is. We're inviting you right now and begging you right now to show us your setup as you go on Wine Wednesday. <laughs> 
show us as you go. But I will say, and whoever just subscribed, thank you for subscribing. Sorry, I'll look in a second. Um, but when you guys are getting ready to show something, um, tell me that you're getting ready to show or something because it takes me a second to jump over and make you big screen. So, um, and we definitely want to see whatever you're showing. But uh, cool, but, cool, Ray, cool. How are you doing? Ray Ford? That was you, Ray. She asked how you're doing. Are you muted, sir? Oh, yeah. I forgot to unmute when I come back. <laughs> I know. We do it. Go ahead. Just checking in, sir. I was, uh, yeah, I just got back from feeding them, and then I sat down, and I was trying to figure out how to uh, uh, put a picture up. Like uh, on Cheryl's there, she has seahorses. But uh, I don't know how to do the uh, controls on here. I clicked on stop video and... Uh, right. Oh, wait a second. There it is. Okay. No. Profile. I guess what I did before is I clicked on that little arrow thing yeah. and uh, got a page come up and I couldn't understand it. Yeah. It's their screen. I'm not young enough for this new technology. We're going to, hey, Ray, I sent you a personal message and I will continue to do so if needed, but the link won't change and we're going to get you up to date. You're going to have a flashing background before you know it. <laughs> I'll make it for you. Okay, guys. So another thing that I've seen a lot, like it never ends, and I always feel bad for saying anything, but I just hate for anybody to have the wrong impression is seahorse color. And I know we've talked about this before, but how many of you in like the past week have seen a post or someone saying, you know, I'm going to buy these red seahorses or I've got these bright pink seahorses for sale or whatever. Yeah. Who said yeah, Holly? Yeah, I see that now and then. <laughs> and what are your thoughts on it? Well, they're gonna change the color of their environment. They're like chameleons. So once you get them away from the red stuff that they're hanging out with in that tank, they're gonna turn the color of your algae or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or rock. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean to keep jumping to Dan, but Dan, um, as a breeder, I know personally, because I've dealt with you for seven years, however long years, um, that you are very clear with someone buying a seahorse that you will not sell them a seahorse based on color. And most good breeders, I you know, seahorse savvy, any of the good, the, you know, the, or the local breeders don't pull that trick. Why is it still... Um, something that people assume is okay is ex they can do and why do why would anyone sell seahorses based on color today well the problem is and I just changed the background here intentionally okay let me make you big let me, oh, shit, let me make you big go ahead sir the, the picture that is behind me is of H. Reed I and those guys I ordered came in black and they try to get me to upcharge, up, up pay for colored seahorses. And I always tell them, no, I'll take the black ones. I put them in the tank, and that was what they looked like after two weeks. Mm -hmm. It took two weeks to turn them like that. Right. And I used to have a couple of commercial companies that would send me their seahorses and have me turn them yellow and send them back to them so they could sell them as yellow seahorses. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing to remember with seahorses is, is that color can change. The markings and patterns can change. Cirri can change. All these are variables that are subject to change. And, you know, some people will say, well, if they're already that color, they have a higher likelihood of staying that color. And that's not necessarily true either. And um, I don't care what you do. The seahorses are going to decide what color they want to be you have no choice in the matter whatsoever. And it's almost like buying a cuttlefish and expecting the cuttlefish to say a certain color. It's just not gonna happen. Seahorses just aren't as quick with the change as the cuttlefish are. Um, I'll show you another picture here. Um, I do have a question when you're done, but go ahead. 
Okay, well, you can go ahead with the question while I find this picture. Okay, my question is that I did some research on this for a video that I put that is many years old now, but still good information, guys. Check out all the videos on Seahorse Whisperer on YouTube. Clink, yep. clink. Long picture. Okay, anyways, my question is when I was researching this, it gets really scientific, and we don't do science very well on this channel. But go. point being, it was like certain species have certain melatonin and certain colors that they can turn into. So while all seahorses will blend into their environment, it the the research that I read, which may be old now, indicated that certain species had like certain colors they could be. For instance, you get a barbori. I've never seen a barbori black. Maybe I'm crazy, but I've never seen one be black. Um, red eye tend to be really exotic colors. So does the species or where they come from matter when we're discussing this? Because like the Cuda, you, sell, you, you sold me, the orange and the yellow, they never turned black, no matter what I put in the tank. So go ahead. I got them black right now. Um, really? Wow. Yeah. Um, I will say that some species have a range of colors they will stay or can go to more predominantly than, than um, others. You know, it's rare to see a really a black Barbary, for example, but it's very common to see brown ones and sometimes dark brown. Um, you know, the reed eye do have a propensity to be brighter in colors than, say, some of the other species. But I think all the species can change colors to some degree. Um, you know, the, the age old thing is the red color. The red color is a real toughy, but you know, when I used to get the black seahorses and they used to morph, they would go from black to a, uh, reddish tone to an orangish tone to yellow. And it was the same progression every time. And it was real cool when, and the, the reddish color was more of a maroon color, not a bright red. It was kind of a dark, dark red, but it was real cool to watch that transition. Yeah. Um, the picture I have behind me, mm -hmm. um, there we go. Those are all the same seahorse in different colorations. This is a picture that Lucy gave me and she's posted it many times and it's kind of chopped at the top and the bottom, but, um, each of those pictures you can see up in the top corner is kind of a blackish color and kind of orange below that, but, but all those pictures are of the same seahorse showing different colors mm -hmm. wait give me one second i'm trying to make it really big screen but it's not working out for me so uh all right hey kelly go ahead the, the female in in my picture uh-huh is a walcott female hippocampus combs and basically she stayed that color for over seven years wow and she never changed. Wow. Yeah, see, so I, I, I you know, I just was, wonder, I think some species maybe can keep their color better than others or when they're happy, they're a certain color. But I certainly agree that it's not something, you know, it, it, it yeah. frankly ticks me off some keep when it, I see some. Some keep it, some don't. And this female, I mean, I loved her. She's beautiful. She is. And she never changed. Well, she's your love in your heart, honey. That's different. <laughs> but no, I'm kidding. But I mean, I just it just makes me so angry when I see people selling seahorses for ridiculous amounts of money. Now, when you're talking about a new species like the zebras and they're wild caught and hopefully a breeder or, you know, someone who can handle wild caught species um, gets them. That's different. I get it. It's new. But when people are selling bright red seahorses, that shit, that, excuse me, that makes me angry. That was my nice face. Well, by the same token, you also get the people that are demanding to buy that type of thing. Right. I had a customer who spent $800 to buy a red seahorse from another competitor. And we went round and round over the issue. And it took her two months later to call me up and tell me I was correct. Of course. Um, it's not going to stay red. Are there any species, like even like obviously pygmies don't even aren't even sold, but I'm just saying, are there any species that do stay the same color? Do you have any clue? 
I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. I don't, I don't rely on any of them to stay the exact same color. I think the most likelihood of staying the same appearance would be the zebra and the other one that looks similar to it, which I can't remember the name of. And I wish Sam have never changed. I have seen the abs change, not not completely. You know, they the markings pretty much stay the same, but I've seen them get brighter um, in the yellows and stuff that come into the color. Um, I've also seen them darken up some, but they still have the white belly and, and what have you. I've and noticed I changed in uh, over four years. I was going to say, Ray, you know, I, I get that, that I get what you're saying because with my Barbori, they never changed in color much at all. I had one that was freaking gorgeous. Like she was white iridescent white see-through oh my gosh i miss that see -through. anyways she never changed and i had one that was yellow that never changed i i really i hope that anyone who does watch this later who might be like nancy if you're listening <laughs> we need some research on color change with certain species because dan's right everything he said is right but i have I, i've seen like ray said a species or a, my particular seahorses in a species stay the same color, but I certainly wouldn't buy based on that. And my um, barbs change colors. Isn't that funny? Isn't that crazy? We talked about it one other Wednesday night. I know. But the first batch that I had, uh, I don't know, maybe, I'm guessing maybe 15 years ago, they also came from Australia, just a different source. And, um, uh, those ones changed colors also, but uh, they were uh, more the brown that uh, Dan was talking about a little bit earlier here, where these ones are more to the yellow range, but uh, they'll get to the dark range and then they'll get to a, a light uh, yellow range and sometimes they'll get uh, the brown appearance to them. But they don't all do it at the same time. It might be one or two will do it at the same time while the other two remain whatever uh, color they're at at that time. But um, there's nothing, they don't all change at the same time. Now that's really interesting. Why do you think that is? I, I, I've to do with I've seen that many day. times. Okay, hold up. What, Ray, what'd you say? Something to do with their own, own individual personality, maybe. And Dan, what were you going to say? Well, they, I've seen it many times. They don't all change color at the same time. Um, it depends upon, you know, the tank, the, the seahorses. I mean, there's, you know, like I was talking about changing the whole group, they would all transition pretty much on time with each other. But if I add a, a couple of seahorses to a tank in a smaller quantity, it's much more hodgepodge in how they change. Interesting. Cool. All right, guys. Well, what else um, have you seen lately that you know is incorrect, we've known is incorrect, but it's still being pushed online. Anybody? Which is really worrying, which I've seen pop up a lot, is that um, captive bred seahorses have like temperature resistance bred into them. And that's a really worrying one. I've seen a lot of people say, oh, I can put them, you know, in a system connected to my 26 or 27 degree reef tank because they're temperature resistant seahorses. Um, I've never uh, heard that. <laughs> Holy cow. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I've been seeing that one a lot lately. And that's, yeah, really worrying. And it also doesn't really make much sense because I guess um, it's not the seahorse itself a lot of the time that needs to be quote unquote temperature resistant. But it's a bacteria that might infect the seahorse or, you know, whatever else. So um, that one's been popping up a lot. I'm not sure if that's coming up just in Australia or if um, you guys are getting a lot of that too. But it's been coming up a lot. Well, first I'll say you all are killing me because we just should have done Vibrio. <laughs> Bacterial. Because, no, I'm, I'm teasing. Of course, always we can talk about whatever. Dan, I'm shutting up. Go ahead. Yeah, I bred my kids to be more disease resistant, to be uh, better looking, <laughs> smarter, um, w wealthy, and what have you. Um, right. you're, you're not going to change the the animal over breeding of a few generations. You know, if you take a look at dogs, 15,000 years ago, 
you know, before man was keeping them as pets and versus today. And you look at the transition of all the time that we've had with dogs, their DNA structure has changed very, 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 very little. They, they do have some minor things that have come about, but that's over 15,000 years. And over a period of three, four, five, to even 10 generations, you're not going to be able to breed temperature resistance into the animal that fast. And people that say so, I disagree with. Um, you know, that sometimes they get lucky keeping them at warmer temperatures or something, but it's not because they bred that into them. You can't breed it into them, right? I mean, well, in theory, you could, but you know, if you spend over a million life, zillion it. years, <laughs> like evolution, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it is a evolutionary type thing. And you, there's some traits you can breed into animals. And I think there's other traits that are much, much, much more difficult. We can breed in their personality better than we can breed in the physical traits. Um, unless we do some type of manipulation. You know, I did manipulation with the, the minis and I did manipulation with the uh, piebalds. But that wasn't... A, a hereditary thing that was me manipulating nature i was just gonna i was actually gonna ask you uh before we got off the color topic and i forgot about the piebalds but did you just say you're manipulating nature <laughs> what that phrase i'm sorry you went quiet kelly i did yeah, yeah. we can hear you but you're much quieter um in okay. a sense yes i mean I, it wasn't i did something to change the outcome okay it wasn't a gene, you know, something with their genes where I bred that into them. It was me influencing them as they grow. Awesome. Can you guys hear me now? We Same can hear cool. you, just quieter. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. There you um, go. Now there I you sound go. louder? Yes. Yep. <laughs> I did nothing to change it. Okay. So, you know, guys, we're testing <laughs> Zoom. That's why we're testing because we've had a few audio flip-flops with Dan earlier and now me. Um, in fact, this is a really important topic. But really quickly, I wanted to show everyone before I forget the wine, you know, that here's another version that we could have, uh, if it'll work. One moment. Would you prefer a version like this where the screen is bigger, um, I could even make it literally the whole screen so you could see the people better, kill the words, whatever. So that's the poll for next week. Check in the event to take the poll and let me know. Would you rather see the people bigger instead of counting on me to jump between people and et cetera, or do you like the natural and normal look? All right, now that I've done my, my ad, I forgot what we were talking about. What were we talking about? We're that's on to the next topic. Different. Did you say you were going to show us? You can't see it. You'll see it in the video. Watch later, Ray. Oh. Sorry. I'm just curious which view people are using at the moment, the uh, speaker view or the gallery view? Personal preference. I have the gallery view, but, you, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah, I'm using gallery view, and then the speaker is big and highlighted. Everybody else is in a bar along the top. So anyone watching, I'm sorry. If you click out, try over your, what, are you on a computer? Yeah. At the top right yeah, corner so where it when says it view. goes to gallery view, then I see everybody. Exactly. So but it's a matter yeah. of preference. So if you join I us. Like speaker view. I can still see all you guys on speaker view because there's not a lot. Yep. Sure. And if we had a bunch of people. Um, and you're ever in the room, or if I'm ever streaming and anyone in the audience notices that I've got one person big when we've got 20 people talking, uh, definitely, you know, tell me, raise your hand or something, because this is speaker view where Miss Holly is being, or I, apparently, am I being shown right now? I'm not even sure. Anyways, it's a big full, full screen um, edition of the person talking or gallery view shows everyone. So we're having an edumacation on Zoom <laughs> during Wine Wednesday. <laughs> the other thing I was curious about is why do you have yourself up under Kelly and Seahorse? 
Um, because uh, Dan educated me last night that even though Zoom records these sessions, um, if I if I want to do something later with the recordings, like make smaller copies of the recordings, important things, I should definitely have a backup. So I'm literally logged in on two computers. Oh, I see. Yeah, I did that at Macna too. So and I'm going to probably uh, figure out how to adjust it so it's at least not shown. But that's that's the deal. And I would never post anything without, you know, letting y'all know. So no worries. Obviously, this is live. You know, you're, you know you're being seen. But anyways... Okay, so yeah, next. yeah, next. next, next. Okay, what else have we seen online, guys? Nobody's seen anything online. You guys all fail. <laughs> well, there's so many, so many myths. Let's do it. All right, how about seahorses are hard to keep? Well, shit. Oh, I keep cursing. I'm so sorry. It's the one. Uh, Felicia covered that very well on Wine Wednesday. Buy, buy some Check good out that wine, video. <laughs> I know. The cheap wine goes to the head. No, I'm kidding. Actually, this acronym, it's my favorite. It's wonderful. But I, I'm, I'm actually kidding, guys. I really do mean that Felicia did a fabulous speech hitting all the key topics um, at the MACNA 2020 online seahorse and pipefish event. Uh, Marina was there. Nicole, Holly, all of them were there, I believe. And Bottom line is, I have posted it, so go check it out, because she did a great job. But Dan, go ahead and, and, and add to that, please. Okay. Very often, you'll hear people say, I don't, you know, they ask about keeping seahorses, and a lot of people will say seahorses are hard to keep. The reality is, they're not hard to keep. They're different. And if you account for those differences, they're actually quite easy. They're just different. And if you set up, you're good to go. So, and we hate to think, sorry, sorry. Right, hate right. To think that um, for people to think it's hard now, what they would have thought 18 years ago when I started. Right. Well, that's where a lot of that comes from, you know, is that, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot of the information that's myths today that we encounter originated years ago. And some of it was based, you know, it was harder to keep seahorses 20 years ago. Uh, we've learned a lot. We've learned what they need. We know how to do much better, and it's much easier. Um, some of the stuff is just plain bad information, but some of it is based upon past experiences. My first seahorses were back in the 80s. I had an under gravel filter. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how things were back then. I remember them. And then I got a power head, I remember. And then I read power heads bad because, you know, it makes the flow too much for them. But they enjoyed it. They would ride it like a roller coaster. Well, that's, hey, that's Holly, the, the you just myth. nailed. Uh, yes. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Holly just nailed the next incorrect false statement. Go ahead, Dan. I'll let you do it. Let's see require low flow and that's incorrect you know we were talking earlier um, about higher flow with seahorses See, and, and, and in conjunction with that there's also the myth that they're bad swimmers they're not bad swimmers they're actually very good swimmers just not for long durations um, I like to think I don't like to think of them as an alligator but if you take an alligator as an example you know if you take a look at that creature and watch him they're very slow moving. They don't look like they can move very quick, but they can run 20 miles an hour. They can outrun a human. And um, seahorses in short distances are actually very strong, very quick in swimming, but their build doesn't lend to them to be perpetual swimmers. They can't swim perpetually like a fish can. And they do very well in higher flow tanks, provided it's not a jet stream that makes them do somersaults across the tank. But as you noticed, when there's higher flow, they'll put themselves up in the flow at times. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Being a rather sedentary creature that often is stationary, getting up in the flow blows some of the stuff off of them. It's much like us taking a shower. It's, it, it's invigorating to them and, and cleans them off. In my macro tank with a bunch of seahorses, I noticed immediately not only that they were so much happier with the flow when I added it, but also, as you're talking about, any algae that was 
growing on them seem to go away very quickly. So, anyone else have thoughts on this? Love that blank space. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs> All right. And anyone, uh, sorry, I'm back, guys. Sorry. Anyone in the audience, um, or if you watch this later and you've seen something online that you just don't think is probably correct or you've heard debating issues on it, please comment. Um, we're we're going to cover all these things and more topics later. But what else, guys? Marina, I know you got so much up your sleeve. <laughs> Oh, there's just there's just so many. Um, another one which I've only got twice, so I guess at least that's a good thing. It's not being um, pushed around too much. Is captive bred seahorses are okay with um, corals that sting? Ooh. Because they've grown up. Because apparently they've grown up in mixed reef tanks. Um, I don't know. I've gotten that one a couple times, and I just say, oh. Let's just, let's I just, let's settle, right. I'm sorry, let's settle this right now. Anyone who ever watches this, you cannot breed into seahorses the ability, maybe after millions and zillions of years, evolution, all that good <laughs> stuff, but you cannot breed into seahorses the capability of being stung and being okay. Am I wrong, Dan? Raise your kid next to a beehive and it becomes <laughs> adult, see if it gets stung. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Just cut all yeah. the stingers off the corals. Cut all the stingers. <laughs> there you oh, go. No. The, the thing is, what well, people don't, don't realize often, and this is where people make a mistake, is that seahorses are not a reef creature. Now, there's a couple of species that are found near the reefs, but they're more of an estuary type creature. And if you set your tank up with that idea in mind, they're going to be happier and you're going to be more successful. People try to fit the round peg through the square hole, the square peg through the round hole, whichever way it is. Uh, it doesn't always, it, in fact, it rarely works out well long term. Um, done? Yes, with high selectivity in terms of what you put in the tank, it, you can get it done, but it's much easier to have a species specific tank and not try to, you know, take two worlds and merge them together. That's actually what I was going to ask you is whether or not any of the people you know or your customers had ever succeeded with seahorses in the reef tank and whether or not it was long term. But you basically just go ahead. Yeah, that, that's correct. Now, what I have seen that has worked is where people have partitioned off a reef tank. Mm. And we're talking about a very large tank. And part of the partition was for the seahorses and part was for the, the reef section. And they were able to compromise on temperature and you know there was some challenges involved and when they asked me if it could be done my answer was you know most things can be done but how much effort and how much money and right. time are you willing to make it work and that's actually uh bringing me to the next thing that i've seen a lot that's actually changed when i first started with seahorses it was absolutely a no 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 go to put seahorses with pipefish and the main reason that that I that that made sense to me was because seahorses that we buy for the aquarium should be better be captive bred, and whereas most pipefish were wild caught because they're in the same family, Cygnathids, they all lack that galt, good sciencey stuff. They don't have the immune system to deal with things the way other fish do. Bottom line. And so you put two of the, you know, a captive bred and a wild caught, the wild caught's going to bring something in and kill them or vice versa. That's, and the same thing goes for species. But bottom line is now we have captive bred, cap, uh, geez, I'm messing up tonight. I'm sorry, guys. We have captive bred pipefish. So is that different now? We went from it's all good. It's a no go. Are we now at if they're all captive bred, it's okay. Or are we still doing Dealing with species, not mixing. I think you're still mixing species, and uh, quite often you can get away with it, but I still think there's some risk. Um, and and pipefish can go in a reef tank because they don't wrap around things, and they don't. Yes. Pipefish don't have the same temperature 
issues, right, too, also? Um, they seem to be a little bit hardier than seahorses when it comes to temperature, and that's an outward um, observation, not one I can base upon trial and error fact, you know, in factual information. Has anyone else in the room right now, or I'm sorry, in the Zoom right now, has that, have you guys seen a lot of seahorse pipefish mixed tanks that are successful? Uh, no, I'm dropping out now. I've got to walk this dog here so he can do his chores. Thanks what's to what? Ray. We'll, we'll see you again. Ray, what's the dog's name? Skyler. Have a good walk, Skyler. Thank you so much for coming, Ray. I'll make sure you're here or have a link every week. Whoops, he's up now. Take care, man. <laughs> Good night. Night. Hi, Ray. Sorry, I wanted to put him in speaker yeah. view and show the dog. Going back Sorry. to what you were talking about, Kelly. Yes. Um, it, it's interesting because you see seahorses listed as being endangered, but you don't see pipefish being listed as endangered. That's interesting. And they they occupy the same areas, and I question, you know, the validity. First of all, the the, the seahorses are endangered. I think there's a couple of species that are, but there, there's some species that clearly are not having any population issues. So, you know, I, I consider that bad information when you lump all seahorses as being endangered. I think that's patently false. Um, well, wait, 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 uh, wait, wait. I've got, I'm so sorry. I mean, no disrespect, but I got to interrupt you there because I've sure. worked with a lot of the people that, like, um, work on the list and they they list them as not really endangered kind of endangered very endangered i mean they they have qualifications like you know but that's not how they're listed with uh cites and that's not how they're treated okay. and the first time that somebody publicizes something in a paper or a news article they put them out as being you know and if you listen to certain groups the, they're going to try to tell you that you know oh my god it's there you know there's a countdown clock on a website for example of when they're going to become extinct for god's sakes um those people make money off of off of people thinking that they're going to be endangered and, and you know it's part of their funding uh stuff well not to get too deep or too political or whatever but i totally get your point i totally get their point too though because there's got to be a middle ground. Like, I really like, I can't think of the name. Is it I, I C U N? Right. There, there, there is a middle ground. I'm looking if it up. If you look today within Sorry. the hobby, we're doing captive breeding. Right. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not really pulling the numbers from the wild like they were at one time. And, you know, there's big efforts to stop the traditional Chinese medicine from doing it. And in fact, the, the Chinese are doing massive breeding operations so, you know, there's already change that's going into effect. Um, I just don't believe that every species is on the verge of extinction, as some would try to make it sound. Now, I, I still believe in protecting them. I'm just, not say, I'm just saying they're not all in danger to become extinct in the next week or two. No, I, I completely agree. And the CITES regulations really mess things up uh, quite often. But I think they're, I, I do think they're trying. I think it's a big job. I have a lot of respect for Project Seahorse. I have a lot of respect for, I looked it up. IUCNredlist.org, IUC guys. Um, and they do try to say, you know, these species, don't touch them. These, these, this species, you know, have a permit or whatever, and they try to make rules. You know how it goes. Sometimes regulations get in the way and when there's good people trying to do things like breeding captive breeding that's that's good but then also we want to protect in the wild it's just a it, yeah what are you what are the rest of your thoughts because it's touchy for me <laughs> anyone i'm not too sure i don't know i guess too much about which species are endangered and which aren't but um I guess the overall side of people, overall positive side of people thinking they are all endangered is hopefully they care about them a bit more and try not to take too many out of the wild. But um, 
it also, I think, takes away a little bit from the species that are. So I guess there's that balance. Yeah, it, it is a balance. And Marina, what's really interesting, um, and guys, when, we're, when you're not talking, I need to learn this too, but mute when you're not talking. But what's really interesting is literally, you know that I'm very good friends with people in Australia, and I had, I based on the people that I've talked to, I thought that um, hippocampus white eye was on the verge of ex extinction. And then I learned that no, <laughs> they're doing much better in Australia and they're actually being captive bred, which is amazing for other reasons, but it's just, you know, confusing. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry guys, I just, we're talking false, false stuff about information. I want to make sure we give both sides of the coin. And I wanted to mention also that um, Lylan, um, I do see that you're in the Zoom room. Feel free to raise your hand or speak up if you have anything to say. Go ahead, Marina. Me. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. That's, that's my email thing. So well, well, silly I'll me. I like that on Zoom. <laughs> I know that you'll always speak up. Go ahead, Marina. What, what were you saying? Um, that's one that got a lot of the whitey got a lot of um media attention lately. There was a um a, a few segments on the news, um down here about the whitey, and I think another thing that's important to know, like sort of, know the difference between is there's extinct and there's extinct in the wild, or endangered and endangered in the wild. Good point. And to my understanding, um, yes, yeah, so to my understanding, um the whitey populations in the wild were having some serious issues. Um, yeah, apparently they were endangered. I'm not 100% sure. But um, actually Seahorse Australia has managed to breed them and they are so cute and they have these like big googly eyes. They're a really different looking seahorse. They're really gorgeous. But um, yeah, and there's a lot of sea, um, seahorse breeding programs I don't know, maybe not a lot, but there are seahorse breeding programs where they've actually bred the whitey and reintroduced them to the wild. Yep. They do that with multiple species of fish and seahorses. And yes, go ahead. Yeah, so maybe they were at risk of becoming endangered and that solved the problem. Yeah, no, just... you're right. Maybe they're making the difference that needs to be made. Great point. Great point. And I do, you know, I, I don't want to at all seem like I'm um, going against what Dan said because I agree with him 100%. Um, it's just, and seeing that the Chinese are doing all, making all these efforts to find their own way to breed, captive breed for their, mes, mes, it's one of those nights, guys, medis, medicinal purposes, sorry, um, is amazing, but it's just this touchy thing where if we got rid of all regulations or whatnot, then they probably would be extinct. And I'm glad that they're not. And I'm glad we have amazing breeders that, you know, provide captive bred spe species for the hobby. And yeah, I'm rambling. All right. Anyways, anything else about this topic? <laughs> Cause I'm ready to go. Yep. Go ahead, Dan. Um, <laughs> people just need, Common sense needs to prevail, that's all. I still believe in protecting the species, don't get me wrong. Of course. But I just think that it's overdone on how endangered they really are on many of the species. There are some, like the Capensis, which are truly endangered, and they should be protected. Um, I'm not for mass harvesting, so, you know, I just, I get irritated when I see the... The problem is, is that when we go after species that are not endangered, we create a whole mess of problems that carries over, and the groups that push that are doing it for profit. Okay, I can absolutely 110% agree with that. Absolutely. And there's one more thing that's a big myth with seahorses. You don't hear it as much today, but it used to be very prominent, and that is seahorses mate for life. Oh, good one. I and was apparently, say that one. <laughs> and apparently, people aren't aware that there is a seahorse divorce court, and seahorses are more predominant <laughs> swingers than uh, people realize. You know, when I first said that in a video, I got a comment that said, 
The only reason that your seahorses don't make for life is because you have them in a tiny little box. But it's literally, actually, I'm not going to go on. Is it, is it not true for some species, though, Dan? Because that's a distinction that I've kind of learned, is that most species do not mate for life, but there's a couple that do, or is that not true? I don't know if it's true or not. Um, I know that when I first started way back in 2003, we were taking three male cuda and two female cuda. We'd put them in a tank, and each male would get pregnant one week apart. So the three males, every week we had a brood from each of the three males, you know, one male this week, one in the next, then in another. And we had two females. So the two females were somehow hooking up with the males and getting it done. And, you know, if you watch the interactions within a tank, um, you'll see that, you know, they, they will change. Uh, sometimes they will bond and stay together for quite some time, but... They, they still end up changing. And I've, I've heard other people now, what they're trying to say is that they will mate for the season, not for life. Um, Interesting. I don't even believe that. I think they're opportunistic. You know, you give them the opportunity, away they go. Like every man. Oh, did I say yeah. that out loud? I'm sorry. Well, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a great point, too, because, you know, another thing that people don't realize is that... Um, people don't realize that females can become males and i think that is something that's done in order to perpetuate the species sure well backing up i'm sorry let me turn on my camera sorry guys um backing up just a bit sorry I'm trying to do too much at once um yeah i just lost it completely okay so Perpetuating the species. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm trying to do too many things at the same time. Sorry. No, I think that the reason that uh, females can change to males is, is an effort of nature perpetuating the species. Gotcha. Females can produce eggs faster than males can deliver the fry. And that's what I was going to say. But interestingly enough, I just think that a lot of our scientific stuff, our research and et cetera, um, I don't see it in my own tanks. Because I absolutely agree that they don't mate for life. It, you know, I've seen my males play around and breed with every single female in the tank. Agree that the females make the eggs faster. But I had one male, my, my biggest, best male, who would not mate with anyone but this one female. So could it be personality-based or... I don't know. I mean, if you've got a good partner, sometimes you don't want to let go of them. <laughs> okay, we're getting, we're getting a little too deep here. <laughs> okay, that was a bad I phrase, too. Know, Kelly, they do have their own personalities. I've noticed yeah. that with mine. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, well. So but you know, Rudy, Rudy Cooter said it best. You know, the back when, when they first started doing a lot of the research on seahorses and it was coming into prominence, you know, the... the Telling telling people that seahorses mate for life and that they're endangered and they're threatened and all this different stuff was a means to get the little, little old ladies to open up their purses. Money maker. The money yep. Money maker. Which, I mean, gosh, it's hard to, I mean, it's hard to say anything because that's a good, you know, it's a good cause. But I get it. Yep. The, the one last thing I'll mention that I know of um you don't usually see it among hobbyists, but you see it in printed material is that seahorses primary diet is brine shrimp. No way. That's yeah, still I, online. I've, I've seen, well, I see it in news articles. Um, wow. And the problem is the news articles, they go and look stuff up and they look for previous stuff and they don't realize that, uh, you know, there's a whole lot that's changed within the world and that brine shrimp aren't a natural food for most marine creatures. Gotcha. I actually, when I was trying to write an article for Mazna about the trade of seahorses, I ran into the same problem where everything I found online or any resources were so old, um, they weren't uh, they weren't good anymore. You know, it didn't make sense right. anymore. So I, I totally get your point. Marina, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that 
there's also a bit of a um, part of it that's just nature for any animal to sort of find the best mate or the healthiest mate. Yes. So I think, um, in, I guess it's not my experience, but I can imagine that if you had a tank with, say, three males and three females, but there was one male and one female that were maybe significantly larger or the male had, um, I don't know, the nicest, the biggest pouch or whatever. Um, <laughs> nice way to put it. Sorry. Go ahead. I can imagine, um, you know, those two males, those bigger, two, that bigger female and male um, maybe pairing up because they were, you know, the best partner for each other. Maybe they didn't want the other little younger seahorses or whatever. Yeah. Or and maybe one is the brightest colour and, you know, the biggest female maybe picks the partner she wants and the others get the others or whatever, right? Oh, no, I agree with you 110%. Like, the, the, the species that I'm, or the um, pair that I'm talking about, the male that wouldn't mate with any of the other females, he mated with the big, bad mama. I mean, she was huge. She was gorgeous. I, you're right. I think you're right. Um, and, and they do. Like, Dan, uh, one other question, too. Not really a false fact, but um, are the females or the males more colorful in most species? Because we, I've heard it debated online, and this isn't false or right. It's just uh, opinion. But I've heard it debated online constantly, you know, whether the female chooses to mate the male or the male picks the female. And usually in most species, like outside of the fish world, it's the brighter colored one that's attracting. So thoughts? Well, in the seahorse world, it's a little bit different. Um, you got to remember, these guys got it ass backwards because the male carries the babies. Um, that's not ass backwards, but go ahead. Well, it is, really is. Um, but I haven't seen a difference in coloration of one being having more of a propensity to be more colorful than the other. What nature has done, though, is made it so that the males can flash, and they they mm -hmm. in a in the effort to attract the female, they'll suddenly brighten themselves up or change to attract the female. Now, the attraction between the seahorses. In a general sense, you'll find that if you put a bunch of seahorses in a tank and really observe them over a long period of time, the females will gravitate to the males with the biggest pouch, mm. and the males will gravitate to the bigger females. And the idea being for the female, the bigger pouch can hold more eggs, and to the male, the, f the bigger female can give more eggs. So, so it's not like he looks hot. It's like he can carry more of my babies. Well, no, they, they flash in an effort to look hot. You know, right. it's kind of like the, you know, I, I relate it to the young teenager that, you know, has got his flexing his muscles and you know, <laughs> trying to show off. Um, they, I have videos try, of this, you guys. Go ahead. Sorry. Yep. They do try to impress each other. Um, you know, there is a courtship involved. Oh, yeah. um, but, you know, if you, if you watch them in the tank, generally speaking, the larger of the two, you know, if you had multiples in a tank, those two are likely going to pair up. Absolutely. And the other thing that's interesting, too, is that if you take, for example, let's say you lose a seahorse. So you've got a female seahorse and you got a young male. And the young male comes. That young male will typically go through a massive growth spurt and an effort to catch up to the female in order to do it. And I've seen that many times where I've taken a smaller seahorse put them in a tank with a bunch of larger seahorses and they grow faster. That's awesome. That is so awesome. I'm sorry. Shouldn't be so thrilled same thing by with that. The females. the females will do the same thing. Oh, okay. Still cool. <laughs> Salty reef. I bet you're like, Oh my gosh, what did I join this one Wednesday for? I'm sorry, sir. Um, <laughs> but other people's thoughts. Go ahead, ladies. Marina, Holly. nothing okay go ahead i wonder with some of those um sort of people who have monogamous seahorses if they put sort of a more whatever the seahorse finds appealing partner in the tank if they still would be 
if they would still stay with the same partner or if they'd switch it up real quick? Some yes, some no. But that's a really interesting question because obviously um, hobbyists don't have the um, extensive knowledge of breeders, but breeders will take two seahorses. They hope to find a pair, of course, but they get a healthy male and a healthy female, put them in, condition them, which should be another Wine Wednesday, but condition them and they just make it work. So if there's only one other seahorse in the tank, is it a go? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Wow, it's you're so helpful tonight, that. Dan. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's I realistic. Know. I mean, think about it. You can take two people, put them together. That doesn't mean something's going to happen. That's true. Um, you're right. And with seahorses, it's the same way. Now, quite often, it works. You know, I mean, what choice do they have? Um, now, if you've got multiple pairs in there, then what you try to do is find the pair that, that have bonded and try to move them somewhere let them continue to do their thing uh take take them out of the picture and you got a higher likelihood of the others pairing up great advice and so you don't agree that seahorses are monogamous but you do agree that they pair up and then oh, absolutely okay. they, they will pair up and sometimes they'll pair up for a long period of time and nobody's going to interfere now so i will say some species are more um promiscuous than other species um you know the reed eye i found were much more faithful in their pairing than say the uh pot bellies or um you know dwarfs Erectus. i found were not monogamous at all um cuda i mean you know there's there's some words i can't repeat on here what i call them <laughs> um, erectus too they're they're at the window or at the glass, ready for a peanut butter sandwich, they're also ready for anything, correct? To a point, I, I found that my erectus generally paired up for a period of time. Hmm. And once I found a good pairing, I would usually move them so that they continued to be a good pairing. The problem with the, we had with erectus was they were a seasonal breeder. So hmm. we were trying to fight that season in a breeding pro process of continuously getting them to breed. And all species don't work that way like have a no. breeding season no reed i were like once they started they were every two weeks that's wow. it they're they're unless they took a break and same thing with the uh tanneroptis cuda they would you know once they started it was for a long period of time that they would continuously pump them out until something broke that cycle wow. erectus on the other hand it's believed that they primarily breed in the, the spring and the fall in the wild. I have two male erectus and a female, and I have one or pretty much a pair, but the male that's single, he flirts with both of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but yes, yes so yes. much yes. <laughs> he hangs out with the other male as much as he hangs out with the female. No, Holly, I'm right there with and, you. My males they, flirt more than they do with together, the females. But she won't mate with him, though. She'll hang out with him, and he'll chase her around the tank, but she only wants to mate with the other one. This is exactly why I am team female. The females choose. I'm telling y'all, I don't have scientific proof, but the male can flirt as much as he wants. She has to choose to give the eggs. The females are still in control, just letting y'all know. <laughs> Well, you know, one of my sales trainers once told me oh, a Lord. long time ago okay. that the male is generally the head of the household, but the female's the neck, and the, the head doesn't do anything without the neck turning it. <laughs> and, you know, in the seahorse world, you know, let's face it, the males go after the females, but sometimes they're not necessarily available, so males will go after males, so... Well, I've seen, and I do know that some of it's like, I'm tougher than you, but when you talk about a seahorse, a male seahorse flashing and, you know, by the way, anyone who watches this later, if you happen to see this, yes, if they turn bright white, but then they twirl around in a dance, they're not sick. They're flashing and they're flirting. But, um, I see the males do that to the males more than the females. Yeah. So, and they'll twirl and they'll, 
with the males, and I'm like, what y'all doing? Wrong way. Yeah, if you watch them, they brighten up, their head goes down to their chest, and they kind of poke their chest out a little bit, and that tail goes back, and, you know, they start doing that, that shimmy and back and forth and around yeah. and around. And But what we haven't mentioned, and I'll give everybody a chance to – um, ask any questions. Uh, we're running really late. I meant to cut this down. But the one thing that I do know is the female nod. Uh, anyone who's seen this, back me up. Because I'm telling you, the male will flash and flirt and court and turn colors and turn, I was going to say tricks, that's not a good word, turn spins. And then the female finally goes and she nods up and then they do their spin to egg exchange. Anyone else experience this? Mm -hmm. No, but I can tell you it doesn't work well with humans. <laughs> it's just not a nod with humans, okay? No, right. you go to a bar, you tuck your head down, you try to flash your colors and do a couple spin arounds and everybody looks at you like you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, uh, go ahead, what Marina. I was just going to say, what about, um, I haven't had experience with it, but I've heard people say, um, like a male and a female will be in the middle of an egg transfer and another male will sort of push in and try and take some of the eggs. I've seen it. Yeah. That, sometimes there's competition for the eggs and, um, from a breeder's perspective, that's a nightmare and that's why you want to separate them, um, uh, sometimes you'll have males that are competing against the same female and they will actually interfere with the breeding process or the transfer process and the end result is you don't end up with a good brood. Um, and it's not as bad with captive bred as it is with wild caught, uh, but it, it's, it can happen with any of them if there's competition for the same female. So if you see a pair become a pair, you need to, if at all possible, if you're interested in breeding, separate them, basically. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Marina. Um, that, that's sort of all I was just wondering. That sort of shows as well, like, even if some of them wanted, wanted to mate for life, the other ones might not necessarily <laughs> respect that. <laughs> Holly's cracking up in the background. She's like, oh, wow, this is life. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Dan. No, it's, it's, she's absolutely correct. <laughs> she's, she, she's too, blah, 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 blah. no, I'm just kidding. Okay, any other um, things that you've seen online, guys, that we really need to bash right now because they're just false and we're sick of seeing them? I've got a list, but I didn't bring it. So, Holly, what else have you seen? I don't really see a whole lot of false stuff anymore. It's more in like older, you know, books and videos and things from long ago. Most of what I see online is actually from you guys. So, I mean, most of what I see now is, is right. Awesome. Right. So, of course. It's a lot different right. than when I started out. Well, the funny thing is, is that in 20 years, we'll probably be, we'll, we will probably be the wrong ones. Who knows? But, you know. Well, technology keeps advancing. I right. mean, one thing, I mean, when I started in the aquarium hobby, there wasn't the kind of equipment and knowledge that we have now, really. Absolutely. It's amazing. We That's changed everything. When we first started this channel, Ray and uh, Dan and Cheryl and many of the old I shouldn't say old, many of the um, veterans, the experienced seahorse keepers breeders were absolutely against the force of so social media. Um, and it can be a bad thing. And that's why we want to do these kind of events where we talk about the things that aren't really true, that are still going around. But it's also a good thing. Like you just said, you know, you're able to get the information from the right people if you're in the right group. Seahorse sources group. Oh, okay. Anyways. Well, the, 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 the point is, is that the, the advantage of the forums over Facebook is, is that you can go back and scroll through the forums and look for topics that cover the material you want to discuss. In a Facebook group, everything is just pushed downward. So it's difficult to go back and find information. Even when you use the search feature, 
unless you're really good with search terms and something can be pinpointed, it can be very tough to go back and find stuff. The other thing is, is with the forums, it was very easy to tell who had experience and who did not. On Facebook, it's much more difficult to tell who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. Actually, that's a great point. Final, final question for me, and then if you guys have any, we will do them or we will cut it. But how many times do you guys see someone post a fabulous tank and you don't see a single person ask, how long has it been up? That's a, that's a great point. And I'll tell you that, you know, what I used to tell people on the forums was if you if somebody's going to give you advice, find keeping seahorses and how long they've been keeping the same seahorses. Because unless you've kept the same seahorse for 18 months, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I don't want to hear any of the advice from them. Um, Admire their tank, of course, but. Right, right. You could, it can be great at setting up a tank, but in terms of getting seahorse advice, they really need to have some experience with it. And a lot of these people have had one pair of seahorses and they've had them for six, nine months or whatever. They feel like they've become experts and they haven't had multiple species. They haven't had multiples of the same just because what they see happens in their tank isn't what happens all the time. And I just want to follow that up with Nicole, Holly, Marina, anyone who, not saying you guys have, but anyone who hasn't kept their seahorses for that long, we still value your input and value you being here. It's just what he's saying very clearly is, you know, obviously you're, you guys aren't going out there and telling people you need to do it this way, this way, that way. That's exactly uh, right. Correct. Right. So we, we value everyone's input and that's what we're here for is to share in the community. But it's just scary. It is scary because I see something online and I'm like, nobody asked the question, how long's the tank been up? Nobody asked the question, what's your parameters? Well, nobody asked the question, what else is in the tank? crazy but okay i'm gonna shut up anybody there's else also just... <laughs> good um there's also just like with the whole experience thing it's over a long enough period of time more things will go wrong more things will go right um you can buy 20 seahorses and put them in the tank and keep them for six months and they might be doing great but that's not really it's not long enough to really see how everything plays out. Absolutely. Dan, can you tell very quickly your skimmer story? <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll tell that story in a minute, but um, a great example of what you're talking about, uh, Marina, is I have a customer that's been keeping seahorses for 10 to 12 years. And about every 12 months, he orders new seahorses. And he's got the tank overstocked. And I've multiple times, every time he calls to order seahorses, we go through the same ritual where I try to explain to him that if he had a lower stocking density and if he did things a little bit different, he could keep the same seahorses that whole period of time. But he's more interested in having that tank look full than he is in the longevity of the seahorses. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and be judgmental about it, but, you know, that's not the guy that I want giving advice because he can't keep seahorses long-term. Uh, even though he's been at the hobby for a long time, he can't keep the same seahorses long-term. Um, and what were you saying, Kelly? You want me to talk about skimmers? Well, first of all, I want to back that up and say everyone that joins this, this group and comes to Wine Wednesday is like fighting for their seahorses and their fry. And you guys are amazing. So totally different topic. But no, I was just going to ask you to cover the skimmer story about the marine biologist oh well that in that particular instance where i was dealing with a guy this was on the forums before i went to facebook we had a marine biologist that uh, set up a dwarf tank and the way he had it set up i told him it would not work long term and he was breeding uh dwarf seahorses and selling them and he was going like hotcakes for about two or three months. And I told him it wouldn't work long term. And roughly nine months later, he disappeared. We never heard from him again. And it's very common for people to get seahorses. And the period of time 
if you don't set things up correctly, the the critical time point where I see problems develop is somewhere between nine months to a year, sometimes just a little bit beyond that. The lack of a skimmer, the, the um, maintenance issues and what have you, it takes time for that to catch up and for it to have a detrimental effect, unless it's something real bad that can happen instantly. But for the most part, most people don't have problems in the beginning. It's a few months down the road when the problems start developing because of you know, the lack of a skimmer or certain maintenance issues. And just to mention again, guys, um, I'm going to try to put together a listing of the Wine Wednesdays where we discuss how to set up a tank. We can always cover it again if you need us to. And again, I have to mention Felicia's uh, speech at MACNA 2020 online, Seahorse and Pipefish event, that is now listed on the Seahorse Whisperer YouTube channel, covers some of these basics. And I'll try to get a listing of the many times we've talked about it. But again, we can always talk about it again. But great points. And um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's scary that advice can get out there from anybody. I get that that's scary for sure. Um, anything else from any of the ladies or Salty Reef? Did you want to share anything since you've finally come back to us? No, no, I really don't have much going on right now. Well, are you still setting up the seahorse tank? Um, yeah, it's kind of on hold, but yeah, sure. it's coming. Well, I'll talk to you afterwards. I just wanted to give you a chance to speak because we've missed you terribly. And Lucy managed to pop in tonight, and we miss her terribly. Go ahead, Salty. No, that's all I had. Okay. Well, anything else from anybody? Kelly's... Um, Started the wine too early, so we're going to have to end this. <laughs> but if you have any other questions, comment, or if you have any other questions right now, please ask. I'm going to take that as it's time to go. <laughs> Dan, was there any time to cut it? Yes, I yes, would agree. It's time to cut it. Okay. Happy Wine Wednesday, everyone. Everyone say goodbye. Bye. Bye. Happy Wine Wednesday. See you next week. Cheers.